everybody. Welcome back to another very exciting Adobe Live. I am your host, Jesus Ramirez. How's it going today? It's so good to have you here with me. I'm streaming from the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area, although it's a bit cold today. Let me know where you're watching from. It's going to be another very exciting Photoshop bootcamp with a ton of tip and uh, tips and tricks. We're going to discuss Photoshop effects, just how to create cool effects in Photoshop. We're going to have a lot of um, small examples that are going to have a lot of different Photoshop tools that will combine to create a specific Photoshop effect that I'm sure you'll love. So why don't we jump right into the stream? I'm going to go into my uh, monitor here so you guys can see what I'm doing. And we're, we're going to start with this file called Shadows. And actually something that I should do is make sure that I can see the chat. I looked over and I, I didn't see the chat. So now I have to click over and make sure that I'm looking at you guys in case you have any questions or always feel uh, you always feel free to share any questions, comments, concerns, anything you like. Um, here we go. OK, so if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. I now have the chat open and I can see your comments. So you can create shadows in Photoshop, obviously, by using a drop shadow. If you select any layer, it doesn't really matter what kind of layer you have. In this case, I have a text layer with the word shadows. You can double click to the side of the layer and you can click on drop shadow. And obviously, that'll give you a drop shadow. You can't really create a long shadow effect using this technique. One of the hacks would be to click on this plus icon and then to and then you can drag the shadow out a little bit, create another one drag the shadow out and you can keep doing that until you create a long shadow effect if you want. But in my opinion, that takes too long and doesn't give us the effect that we really want. If you wanted to rotate the shadow, you can just change the uh, check the global light and then adjust it accordingly. But as you can see, it only works for that particular shadow because I have to go in there and make sure that my global light is enabled on all. But you, you can already see the problem. The problem is that it is a long shadow, but it doesn't really give us the effect that we want. So how can we create a long shadow? By the way, here's a trick for you. Just as, this is just a side note. When you have layer styles like this, you can right click on the FX icon and select create layers and you can create layers out of those shadows. So that's something you can do if you want, but that's not going to help us in this case. We actually want to create a long shadow and we want to have it so that it uh, is more interactive and it looks better. And one of the things that I recommend people to do is to think about how Photoshop uh, works, how tools in Photoshop works, uh, and then you can use them accordingly to get the results that you want. So let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to make a selection out of the active pixels in this layer. You can do so by holding control and clicking on the shadows icon here to load it as a selection. You can see the selection has now loaded into the word shadows that means that i can now create a layer and fill it with any color i want the background color is currently set to black so i can press Control and backspace to fill with black if the foreground color were white then i'm sorry if the foreground color were black then you can hold alt and backspace to fill with black so alt and backspace foreground color Control backspace background color that's option delete on the mac and command delete on the mac to fill with the background color. So I'm going to disable the selection by pressing Control D to disable the selection. And I'm now going to bring the shadows layer below the shadows text layer. So the black is in the back. Then I'm going to convert this into a smart object. In case you don't know, a smart object is a container. It can hold one or more layers and you can use them to apply non-destructive effects, adjustments, distortions, filters, or transformations. Um, this is going to allow us to edit the shadow if we need to. Then you can go into Filter, Blur Gallery, and select Path Blur. This is a blur generated off this path. So you can see that one side has a an arrow to it. Uh, it's pointing to, in this case, the bottom right. And I can now increase the speed to create that effect. That's not quite a long shadow yet, but watch what happens when we uncheck centered blur. See that? See how we get that long shadow effect and we can now control it with this path. Pretty cool, right? 
and we can increase the speed to make it make it blurrier or decrease it totally up to you and this gives us a much better long shadow effect not a drop shadow a long shadow and that's what i want in this case something like this and of course you can make any other adjustments you like for example you can add a curve to that if you wanted to and create some really cool effects i don't think it's necessary in this case i'm just going to stick with a straight path then you can press ok and now you have your shadow after that you might want to blur it just a little bit more some of these edges are very sharp and they don't look quite that good so you can go into filter blur and choose gaussian blur and just blur it a bit so that the edges are not so sharp if you wanted to create a more convincing effect what you might want to do is duplicate the layer by pressing ctrl j and then going back into the blur gallery here on the label so this is a smart object you can tell that it is because it has this icon on the bottom right and below that you'll see the smart filters and the smart filters that we apply were the gaussian blur and the blur gallery when you double click on blur gallery it will open up the blur gallery but it's telling us now that these smart filters are stacked on top of one another so you're not going to be able to edit the final version just the version of that specific instance of the effect so you can just press ok and then maybe bring down the speed a little bit just to create more of a uh, contact like shadow here press ok and then go into the gaussian blur and maybe blur that a little bit more completely up to you on how you do that the point is is that this will create a much more realistic drop shadow than simply using a layer style so I highly recommend that you think about how Photoshop tools work so that you can take advantage of them in any way that you want. And I see Sam in the chat. Hey, Sam, how's it going? Cool. So let's move on into the next example. And actually, there was something else with shadows that I was thinking about showing you. And I, I completely blanked out that as I was teaching, and as you guys know, since you've been watching this whole week, I, I'll think of random things to show you as I'm talking and, I, and I'll think, oh, that's super cool. I'll show that. But then I completely lost my train of thought. So if it comes back, I'll show you. Let me just open up another file here for you. And in this case, I think I'm going to go for this photo here called before. There we go. And what I wanted to do in this example is show you how to change the color of an object in Photoshop is something that is done very often, but I don't think a lot of people think about all the intricacies that go into something like that. So for this example, we'll just try to change the couch color to blue. So what is the first step when you want to change the color of something in Photoshop? You have to select it. You have to make a selection. There's a lot of ways of making selections in Photoshop. You can try using the new object selection tool. Notice the refresh icon here on the top. It's just analyzing the image. When it's done, you can hover over an object and select it. In this case, it doesn't select the entire couch, but that's fine. So I'll click on that. And then I can add to it with the object selection tool. Sorry about that. Not the object selection tool, the quick selection tool. And I'm just going to click and drag on the blue areas like so. And if it goes over the line, you can hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click and drag to deselect. And I'll just make sure that the blue parts are selected, but not the white pillows or the white blanket. But I do want to select this part of the couch here. Like so. And by the way, if you're having a lot of trouble making selections like a straight line like I am there, a trick is to press the Q key on the keyboard to enter the quick mask view. And from here, you can paint on the layer to create the selection. So in this case, I'm going to select the brush tool reduce my brush size by using the left bracket key on the keyboard. That's the key right next to the letter P in North American keyboards. I'll increase my brush hardness by holding shift and tapping on the right bracket key. Now what I can do is make sure that black is my foreground color. I can press the D key to make those my default colors. Now black is in the foreground and I can click once. Oops, sorry about that. I meant to say white, not black. So make white your foreground color. Now you can click once, hold shift and click again and Photoshop will draw a line between those two points. So then I can really get in there and make sure that those edges work. And I don't want to select the legs. So with black, I'm just going to paint to get rid of those so that they're not part of the selection. 
So the quick mass mode allows you to paint in a selection, which is really useful in some cases, like in this example. And for now, we'll call this mask good. It's not perfect. There's a few issues. Um, we'll can, we can come back and adjust those later, but we'll call this good for now. I'm going to now press the Q key again and notice that the selection is back and we can now work with this. What I'm going to do is create a group, then click on the layer mask icon and that creates a mask based on that selection. The reason that I placed it inside of a group is so that we can place as many adjustment layers in there as we want but only one layer mask is controlling the visibility of those adjustments. And that makes it very beneficial because it, your workflow will increase if you need to change the mask. You will only need to adjust one mask rather than two, three, four, or five masks, depending on how many adjustment layers you have. So it's a very efficient way to work. So now you can go into hue and saturation and adjust the saturation. Now, let me show you why I went this route instead of just doing what a lot of people do. So usually what people do is create a hue and saturation adjustment layer, which is fine, and then click on this icon, click over the image, and then adjust the image by um, adjusting the pixels they selected. So in this case, I only wanted to adjust one couch. Now I'm adjusting all couches in the wall. But let's just assume that I wanted to do that. Let's just assume that I wanted to change the wall in all the couches that were blue, and I wanted to make them yellow. The problem now becomes that, oh, by the way, these sliders allow you to increase the range of affected pixels. So I'm increasing the range just so, to make sure that I get more of the pixels that I, I intend to select with this adjustment. So as I was saying, the, the problem now becomes that if I want to change the color of these couches to yellow, it's going to be very difficult because once I get to, I'm trying to get a yellow here, like that color there, and increase the saturation, notice that the dark areas quite, um, they don't look good, the dark areas. And if I try to brighten the image by using this slider, it's just not going to give me the result that I want. And of course, I can click on colorize, but once I do that, it literally uh, turns the entire image yellow. And... I'm never going to really going to get that yellow color that I want. And by using this lightness slider, I just fly out the image and I don't get any any shadows. So that's why I prefer to create a group where I can now drag that layer in there with the colorize checkbox enabled and then the lightness. I'll just leave it set to zero. And then first control the, contr the hue to set the color that I want. So maybe like a yellow with maybe a little bit of red, make it a little orange. And I can now increase the saturation accordingly, but we still have the problem with the shadows. The way that I would go about that is by creating a curves or levels adjustment layer, totally up to you. In this case, we'll use curves and then I can adjust the shadows independently. See that? So then now when I make my adjustment, it, I'm taking the shadows into consideration, but in a completely separate layer. And I'll probably place the shadows layer in the uh, first. That way the color overlay can be applied on top of that and you get a better result. So by separating the color adjustment to two adjustments, you can now take total control of the color in one layer and the brightness in another. Because if you do it all with the hue and saturation adjustment layer, you just have one slider, the lightness slider, that's it. By placing the control of the brightness of the image on a separate layer, you have basically complete control, right? It's no longer a slider, it's the entire curve. Or if you use levels, then you'll have five sliders rather than one. But, you know, this just allows you to take much, much better control of how the brightness of the image will be controlled after you make that adjustment. So it just gives you total control. So again, nothing wrong with just using one layer, but I just prefer having as much control as possible because sometimes in situations like this, just that one lightness lighter will not give you the adjustments that are required for the color adjustment. And, and after this point, what you wanna do is just zoom in to the image really close and paint on the areas that you miss, paint with white. Remember these adjustment layers are being controlled just by one layer of mask. So I can delete these layer of masks because they're not really doing anything. And I can just focus on this one. And you'll see now 
the advantage of placing everything inside of one group with one layer mask. And obviously I'm going sort of quickly here to not spend too much time fine tuning these details. But the point is that you can come in here and make these adjustments. By the way, something that I will do in a situation like this where there's a lot of yellow on that pillow. Um, I probably, let me see, how, how would I fix this? I would probably paint like that and I know it looks terrible. And what I will do next is erase that. And I'm, we're only looking at the pillow now, so don't worry about the rest of the image. I'll fix that later. And if you go into the edit menu, you can fade the last command that you did. And I would just fade it back until the pillow looks good. You know, whatever, whatever I think the pillow, the pillow probably looks good right about there, give or take. And then I would blur the edges of my brush and I'll do that again. Oops, sorry, wrong. Uh, I painted, I want to paint away. So I'm going to paint with black. Paint the edges and if need be, go back into edit, fade, and then just select an appropriate fade level to kind of get rid of that blue. And then paint with white on the layer mask to bring back the details here. And again, I'm going quickly. I know I went over the edge, but I think you get the idea. So that's how I would go about something like that. And at this point, as I said, it's just fine tuning. Just go look at the areas that don't have good masking and, and make a good mask out of it. Paint with black on these edges so I can make sure that I don't have that white highlight, you know, and spend as much time as you need making those adjustments. But the point is that I would rather make a color adjustment by using those two layers rather than using just one because in my opinion you get a much better result again the reason being that with the hue and saturation adjustment layer we only get one slider to control the saturation or excuse me the brightness the lightness in this case and if we want something very bright it completely flattens the shadows and it doesn't look good so it's best to leave it set to zero and enable a curves adjustment layer and then control it accordingly by using all these different control points so that you can get a result a result that looks Realistic. Cool. Um, let me know if you have any questions in the chat. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Um, what I'll do now is open up a new file and I'll go into Reveal in Explorer so I can see the files that I have prepared for this class. And we'll talk about colorizing now. Um, let's start with, let's see, not this is one image we can use and we'll also use um, let me see. Let me look at this image here. Yeah, we have several images that we can use for this example. And we'll use, oops. Um, we'll use this one as well. Actually, I don't want this one. I wanted this one in its own layer. Um, all right, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to copy this here and go into file and open and I'll paste that in. Here we go. And it's own layer. So we have all these different images. And just for the purposes of demonstration, I'm going to open up one more image and... I think what I'll do is I'll, I have an image here in my libraries panel that I think we'll be able to use. Let it load up. It'll take just a second. And I have, we'll use, let's see. I don't know. I, you know what? I don't know if it'll work, but we'll use that image. Here's a keyboard shortcut. Control shift U to desaturate image size um i'm just gonna make it a little smaller so things work faster during the demo i don't want things slowing down so i'm just gonna make it a manageable size no no not image size um yeah image size why was i why why did i get confused with that 50 percent. yeah cool so I'm sure you probably know that there's a filter in Photoshop, a neural filter using AI that colorizes black and white images. So this is a black and white image. If I go into filter, neural filter, and select colorize, Photoshop will use AI to colorize the image. It does a fairly decent job 
just with one click. You can, of course, make it better by clicking over the focal points. And, you know, maybe I can select the blue that, will, you know, will become her, her jeans, as you can see there. And then you can click to create more of those colors to colorize that part of the image. Now, we knew that the sweater was basically this color because we saw the original color image but assuming that she was wearing a red sweater or a sweater of a different color we can create another one of those points and change the color and make it red or whatever color we want but you know you can add more points to colorize her sweater there it is so this is how this tool works um but what most people don't know is that you could also use it for fixing images with color issues. And that's what we're going to do with all these images. So for example, with this photo, if you wanted to neutralize the image and just make it a natural looking photo, instead of having all these crazy lights, what you can do is go into filter, neural filters, and you can now go into colorize, click on that, and Photoshop will automatically neutralize that image. And it looks fantastic. I wouldn't make any changes here with the focal points like you saw me do earlier. What I would do instead is output as a new color layer and i know it's going to look terrible don't worry this is what you want make sure you output to a new layer and press ok and there is my color layer notice that this layer is using the color blending mode which means it is taking the hue and saturation of the current layer but the luminosity of the bottom layer in other words it takes color from one layer and details from the bottom layer and what you can do now is create a new layer and clip it to a layer below Control alt g this down pointing arrow here indicates that the this current new layer is clipped to the layer below which means that it will only affect that layer and take the properties of that layer remember this is a color layer this is a normal layer that's fine it doesn't matter because it's going to take its properties and what we can do now is fix any imperfection notice notice how she was wearing a green shirt so i can select the eyedropper tool and select the color of that green shirt if i can get to it maybe i need to zoom in to actually click on it there it is and now I can paint in the appropriate color on that layer. And I'll call this layer shirt just so just to stay organized. And with the brush tool, you can just paint, just paint on the shirt. That's all you need to do. Paint it on the shirt just to make it its original color so that it's more realistic or at least more accurate, I should say. Oops, and those are her shorts. So I didn't really need to paint that. I don't think that's part of her shirt. Let's see. Yeah, definitely not. So. I need to erase the green from here, but I think you get the idea that you can fix any imperfections after the fact. Then we can adjust her skin tone because the skin is not really showing on her shoulder here. So I can create a new layer, clip it to the layer below, Control Alt G on Windows, Command Option G on the Mac, and I'll call this layer skin. And now I can select her skin tone and just paint that color in, right? And then you would just do this all throughout the image until you get a good result. You can also bring down the opacity if the color is too strong, like I think it was there, maybe something like that. But the reason that you want to keep everything on separate layers is so that you can make quick adjustments, right? So maybe after I look at my shirt, I decide even though the original shirt was green, maybe I want it to be red or blue or a different color I can do. So I can come in here and make it, you know, a different color. And it's very easy to do because the alternative will be to paint everything on the same color layer. And if you paint everything in the same color layer, you'll have one layer that looks like that, right? And then when I change that to color, this will be the result, which is which looks the same. But if you needed to change the shirt again to a different color, I can no longer easily select that. I will have to just do it all over again from scratch. So I would have to come in here, select the color that I want, and then paint over the image again. And that could take a while. So it's better to keep everything separate so that it's easy to edit. So that's why I separated things into different layers and clipped them to the color layer, which is what I think you should do. It's a more um, efficient way to work. So this is one use case for it. Another use case, which is which should be something like this. If you have a photo where there's an ugly, harsh light that you don't necessarily want on the photo, what you can do is run exactly the same filter. You can go into filter, neural filters, click on colorize. Photoshop will run it. It will make some other colors look 
uh, unnatural, but that's okay. We're not worried about that. Just output to a new layer. That's very important. And I should you could have done a color layer as well if you wanted to. In this case, I chose not to. And then you can do Alt and Windows option on the Mac and click on the layer mask icon to create a black layer mask. And all you do now, and by the way, a black layer mask will hide everything in the scene and or in the layer, I should say. And with white, you can just paint to reveal the areas of that colorized image. So in this case, just removing the green. So I can remove the green from her, you know, maybe I was just unhappy with that green color. And then this just makes it super easy to remove. Like so. And right here is going to be a bit challenging because Photoshop made the background a different color, but that's OK. I can come back and fix that later. It also made the suit a different color. So again, in this case, what I really would have done, I would have taken more uh, note of the color of the suit and I would have just changed that in Photoshop by using those pins. But it's still not a big deal because I can just come in here and on this layer, I can just change the blending mode to color and then select the color of the suit and then just paint on that color layer and that'll give me a better result. And I can do that same thing for the floor but it's just a little more manual labor the point is is that you can use this technique to remove you know crazy highlights and things like that off people's faces and bodies just because they allow you to um easier make those adjustments a lot of t if i had to do this by hand without the neuro filter it would take a lot more time it probably wouldn't look as good maybe who knows but definitely more time consuming so i recommend that you try that technique out and do I have another image? Yeah, this image, basically the same thing as we saw before. Filter, neural filters. And we will do the colorize. And again, it removes that from the image. And you can decide to, if, if, if you sort of like the color effect, but maybe not so much in the face, what you can do is just create, again, a black layer mask, Alt and Windows, Option on the Mac and click paint with white maybe like on her face and then do the trick I showed you earlier where you paint with black again to bring it back and then fade it so you can decide how strong that effect is going to be on the face so maybe not as strong on her face but there's still some of that color in there completely up to you so there's so many things that you can do with this technique how do I remember all this? I don't know. Marsha, I've been doing this for 20 years now. <laughs> so it it just, it, I just remember it. Um, I don't remember anything though. Like my memory is really bad when it comes to things. You probably notice when I'm speaking, I forget what things are called all the time, but I just remember how to do all this for some reason. But I, it really is because I've been doing it for 20 years and I've been working on all types of different projects with all types of different challenges. Most recently, I've been working as a finisher in the Hollywood industry where I work with, um, you know, movie posters and TV posters. So that brings up a lot of new challenges that I've never seen before. So it helps me figure things out. Um, but yeah, just a lot of practice. And that's all. Let me open up the folder and I got to keep an eye out on the time. I'm always really bad when it comes with time because I want to show so much. Let's see. So now we talked about the colorize. Let's talk about. Let's talk about perspective warp. We talked a little bit about it in the first stream, I believe, but we'll dive deeper into it. So perspective warp is a feature in Photoshop that allows you to change the perspective of objects. It doesn't work well with organic objects, but it works better with objects that are that have straight edges and that have faces you know boxes cars trains buildings rooms things like that and after you make your layer mask you can right click on a layer and select convert to smart object again always want to work non destructively when possible it's not always possible then go into edit and choose perspective warp from here you have two options layout and warp start with layout because you need to create a layout of the 
object that you're trying to select you need to create a grid and you have to select the face so i'm going to select this right face first there we go then you create another grid on the other side for the other face you can click and drag and notice that when i get close to the edge it'll highlight in blue see that and you can just release and it'll snap into place and now all i need to do is just focus on these two sides then I can do the same thing on this top side. Notice that it'll highlight in blue. I can release, click on this point, bring it over to this side. It will highlight in blue again. I can release, it'll snap into place. So I only need to worry about this one corner. Great. Now I can click on warp. By the way, they are keyboard shortcuts. You can press L for layout, W for warp, and you can switch between those by using keyboard shortcuts. L and W, L and W. Also, if you're in layout and you hit the enter key on Windows as a return key in the Mac, it'll switch over into the warp view. But if I were to press enter one more time, I will apply the adjustment. But since we're working with a smart object, I can come back in here by double clicking on perspective warp. So layout and warp. We're in warp right now. Once you're in the warp view, you can click and drag on these points to adjust the perspective of this box. And if you were here for day number one, we talked about horizon lines and all that fun stuff. So in this case, we know that the horizon line for this image is right about here because this is the ground plane and I can see the sky. So if I imagine this image without any buildings, only the sky and the ground, I can see the horizon line, which will be about here. And then that'll help me determine more or less where to place this box so that it looks realistic. Ideally, I would draw parallel converging lines to really get the perspective. But, you know, for this stream, I think we'll be okay with this. Then we can use keyboard shortcuts. If you hold shift and click, the line will turn yellow and it will straighten and it's now joined and I can move these around at the same time. And I'll do this on the other side just so that you can see. See that? It just straightens those lines. And you can just make adjustments accordingly. Pretty fun stuff. And the results are pretty cool. Anyway, I know that this is not the perfect transformation. I just wanted to show you how the tool works, but you can see the before and the after, even with that loosey goosey transformation that we did, the image looks much, much better. And that's how the tool works. So we can use that for other things. What can we use this for? We can use this for changing the perspective of a street. For example, we can go into edit, define no, perspective warp. Sorry about that and just make a layout of this street and it doesn't even have to be perfect in this case it could be very very loose i'm just making sure that i get everything as best as possible but again it doesn't have to be perfect i'm sure that this will be just good enough this loosey goosey grid and i'll do the same thing on the other side and i'm just trying to get the general perspective i'm not going to be like super exact and we'll call that good I can now go on warp and hold shift, click on this yellow line, and now I can just change the perspective of the street. See that? So maybe you're trying, I don't know, maybe the image you're working on, you might want to see more of that side of the street, or you might want to see more of this side of the street. Totally up to you. The point is, is that you can change the perspective of these things, and it's super, super cool, super fun. Completely up to you what you do with this technique, but I just wanted to show it to you and let you know that it is available. Also, if you have something that looks like this, and actually what I really should do is, this is actually the finished file. What I should do is not use this so that you can see how I made that. So basically, if you look at this image, you see that we have steps, right? We have this shorter side, this longer side, shorter side, longer side. Well, what I could do is create a shape that I'll make it white and then I'll disable the stroke. So we have this longer side with a shorter side. So let me, let me create that. Um, maybe something like that. I don't know. 
Oops, sorry about that. Um, by the way, if you have the, the move tool active, you can hold Alt on Windows option in the Mac and then drag out to scale. And we'll just call this good for now, Control J to duplicate and then move these two. And now we have this. And I can now put them into a group and maybe scale them in a little bit. And that, well, we'll call that good. I can convert this into a smart object and then open up that smart object. And inside of here, just so that we can see what's going on, I'm going to change the colors. So we have a black one here and we have another black one here, but you know, you don't have to change the colors. So what that allows us to do now is we have this little, little grid, this little template, and I can now place these on my image. And actually I made a mistake. I should have done it this way, but that's okay. What I can do now is select the perspective warp and I can create these grids like so try to be as accurate as I can be and then I can do this one here and I can do this one great now I can go into warp and I can start warping these guys. I can put them into position as best as I can. This one's going to go over here. That one's going to go there. And I'm going super fast here, but I think you'll get the idea. And now some of you may be thinking, well, why don't you use vanishing point? Vanishing point is fabulous, but it does not allow you to work with a smart object. So that's one of the downsides. You cannot use a smart object with vanishing point. You have to work destructively. So I, in some cases, you don't want to do that. In some cases, it doesn't matter. So if it matters, then this is a technique you can use. By the way, if you can't see the lines, you can change the blending mode to like um, color. It just makes everything disappear essentially. And then you can just see the lines. And I'm just going to place the lines here accordingly. And I want to go fast just because I don't want to spend too much time fine tuning the tiniest, little, smallest of details for this particular example. But I think that you will get the idea. And I just have a few more points to to match to my steps here. Almost got it. Almost there, guys. Sorry about that, everybody. Here we go. We will call this good just because I spent enough time aligning these points. Anyway, cool. So now that I've applied that, you know, okay, great. So what can I do with this? Well, I'm going to change it back to normal. What you can do now is go back into that group and apply any graphic you want. I know I have some patterns in here. So let's see pattern. We have... We have this pattern. Let me drag it in here. See what happens. I'll drag it in here. And that was that pattern was created from using um, an image in Adobe Capture. It's a photo of a girl in the rain. Uh, she's. I think I've used it for a tutorial where she's got a tattoo on her shoulder. But anyway, it's just a pattern. There we go. The pattern really doesn't matter. So I'm just going to save it just so you can see what that looks like. See, it's there. Now, the cool thing is that now that this pattern is here, what I can do is I can get a little creative. I can put that pattern maybe here and maybe, yeah, maybe I can drag, I'm trying to think here. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll move, I'll move this one up, save all this one, save all this one, and there's our pattern. When I save, you'll see that our patterns is there. And now I can change the blending mode to like, multiply or something um, and then double click to the side of the layer use blend if that we I believe we talked about it during this workshop if not I apologize but I can now use the underlying layer to bring up the shadows and to bring up the highlights just to make this look more realistic and as you can see we can create this effect of actually having that pattern on the steps and if we want to do something for the black ones, we can definitely do that. I can bring this pattern in and just, you know, maybe place it here. And I can place this one, another one here. And I know this, this design is terrible, but I think you get the idea. I think the point is, is that we now have this design right here. See that? 
And if we don't want the black, that's fine. We can just um, hide that. But let me make sure that I add a layer mask over this thing. Oops, sorry about that. I didn't want to do that. Actually, let me think of how I want to do this. Um, yeah, that's what I want. There we go. And you can see now that we have that pattern over this pattern, but it's all where the steps are. And if you want to make adjustments to the positioning, you can always go back into the perspective warp and make an adjustment to fix any imperfections. But this is the reason why I would use something like this as opposed to the vanishing point, because vanishing point, you cannot do smart objects. In the grid where they snap into place, if they will snap into place if you bring edges together, Marsha, I think that's the question you're asking. Let me see. We got about 15 minutes. Great. So another thing you can do with this, actually, I just thought about it. I think I have the file here somewhere. Let me scroll up and there should be yeah, this, this image right here. We have this image of a room, and I'll make it smaller so it might, just so that it's easier to work with uh, during this stream. Yeah, 50% would be good. So we have this image of this room, and we can also use Perspective Warp with that. We can go into Edit and choose Perspective Warp, and then just create a grid that follows the perspective of the room as best as possible. And I'm not going to spend too much time, but it'll look pretty cool once I'm done, I hope. Let's see. That one there. I think that follows the perspective pretty good. And then I'll do this side. It'll snap into place just by being close to that edge. I don't know if that was your question, Marsha. But point is that now I'm trying to find the perspective of this room as best as I can. And I will also do the floor. Like... So and once I have something like this, I can press W to go into warp. There we go. And then I can now rotate the room. See that? Pretty cool, right? I'm just like rotating the room. Something that you probably didn't think you could do with Photoshop. And obviously, I can now come in here and then make an even more extreme adjustments. Look at that. Now it looks like we're viewing the room from the top. Pretty cool, right? So, yeah, I highly recommend that you use a perspective warp. Try it out. Try it out on different images and see what cool effects you can come up with. Also, I just saw this image here and I wasn't planning on showing this, but, you know, since I saw the image, I thought about it. Um, something you can do in Photoshop is select the curvature pen tool go into path and then just do a path like so see my path here just the path in a new layer you can now go into filter render and choose flame flame make sure that you select um, number five multiple flames various angles and you can adjust the settings. I don't know how these settings are going to look on this image. Unfortunately, the preview is just a black box, but I can press OK and see what we get. It doesn't look too terrible. Maybe a little bit bigger, right? I'll undo that. Filter. Render. Flame. We'll go a little bit bigger. See what happens. Now. Maybe, that might be too big. Not, not bad. So now we have flames on that fire. And if you want to make something like this look more realistic, what I would recommend, first of all, is disable the path. Uh, what I would recommend is maybe painting on it on a new layer. So you can create a new layer and you can paint with maybe like a light yellow color, something like that. And then just come in here and paint like so and change the blending mode to like overlay or maybe something like color dodge. But then double click to the side of the layer here uncheck transparency shapes layer see that and then use the fill opacity and then maybe control like how bright it looks and maybe it might be too yellow maybe i can change this over into the 
reds or something like that. Let's see. Yeah, red might be better with more saturation, you know, something like that. And then you can just keep painting, uh, maybe even with white at this point, on the areas that are really going to have a lot of uh, highlights. I'll probably do that on top here. So paint with white, double click to the side of the layer, uncheck transparency shapes layers, and change the blending mode to color dodge, and then just adjust the opacity accord or the fill accordingly and just, just paint, you know, in areas that should have highlight and you can add different colors too obviously red or whatever you want and that brush we made yesterday if you're watching uh, the stream yesterday we made a brush we made a brush at the very end of the stream was it this one yeah we made that brush yesterday what we can now do is take that brush and you know maybe we have oops that's terrible that doesn't look like smoke i guess i didn't save the brush but we went into shape dynamics increase the size jitter the angle jitter the transfer jitter as well maybe even flow jitter we'll increase the count scatter it a bit i don't know something like that and let's see if this looks better doesn't look better let's let's see what else can we do to it um let's change this to off and then we can increase the opacity jitter and flow jitter actually fade uh, we'll, we'll try off Let's see. Okay, not exactly happy with that. So let's bring down the scattering and the count and all that. It wants to go back to pen pressure for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, it keeps going back to pen pressure. That must be that must, there must be some sort of error at the moment. It goes back to pen pressure. See that? Not really sure what that's going on, but no worries. What we can do now is do it all manually from here. Oh, I think it's because this is enabled. Let me let me see if I can change that now. Yep. Do you see this button? I had it. I was using my Wacom tablet earlier, so I had this enabled, this button. So when you enable it, it turns on the transfer by default. So I can disable it and now turning on by hand. And now there we go. See the difference now? That's what I wanted. And I can even reduce the opacity from here and now we can paint in some some smoke and this looks terrible but I think you get the idea anyway that was my side project I, you guys know that I usually go into side projects when I am streaming cool let me open up the next file I see that we only have about seven or so minutes um, something that I recommend doing when you're working with images is to separate the foreground from the background. Um, and why do you want to do that? And so I, clearly I was just at a photography conference, um, a wedding photography conference. That's why I have so many wedding related images, um, for an example today. But the point is that, you know what, maybe I have a different image here for this. Um, here, I'll use a different image, um, an image that I've used in other examples. Let me see. I know I have one in here. Whatever, we'll just use this one. The point is, is that when you're working with an image, it's always a good idea to separate the foreground from the background. For example, I can go into the object selection tool, select this person here. Oh, it looks like my Photoshop is having some issues. There we go. Now it selected the person. It didn't select his head, which I'm not really sure why. But like I said earlier, you can use a quick selection tool to add to a selection. So now I have this person selected and I can duplicate the layer. And then the layer, um, I'll duplicate the layer twice. The original layer, I'll just disable. The layer on the bottom, this one here, with the selection active, you can right click and select delete and fill selection and the person is now gone isn't that crazy person's not gone actually what i'll do before i do that is i'll create a layer mask on that top layer hold control click on the mask and then on this bottom layer i can right click and choose delete and fill selection and the person is gone we have this weird branch here and that's okay we can just use the clone stamp tool and then clone that out just so that it doesn't look so weird and you know try to Blend it as best as you can. And there you go. We have a really nice leaf. And actually, you know what? Maybe that leaf is fine there. I don't know if it's fine. We'll we'll bring it back just because 
we might end up needing it. But the point is, is you could have removed it if you wanted to. So the selection active, right click and select delete and fill selection. Cool. So now on this top layer, what you can do is convert it to a smart object. Now, why do we go through this entire process? So that we can separate the foreground from the background and we can control it much better when we're editing. For example, if I needed to apply adjustments to my foreground to maybe give it more contrast and make it pop a little bit, I can do that without affecting the background. Or if I wanted to apply maybe some color adjustments to the background without affecting the foreground, I can also do so. You know, so it really depends on what you're doing. It just gives you the flexibility to make those adjustments. And what I can do now is with this layer here, the man that's jumping in the air, I can make any adjustments like I said. For example, I can go into edit and choose puppet warp and I can just click on him. By the way, by default, you'll see a mesh. I don't really like the mesh, so I just disable it. And you can click on, on his body and you can make adjustments now. If you hold Alt on Windows option in the Mac, you can make these crazy rotations. You know, maybe you can move his arms if you want, you know, completely up to you how you want to make your adjustment. The point is, is that this gives you total control of the photo. And then since he is on his own layer, we might, you know, can make it seem like he's jumping higher if we want, or he's off to the side or, or whatever you want. The point is that I always like to separate foregrounds from backgrounds so I have total control over the image and make and can make any adjustment that I want. I could also separate her into her own background and give her her own um, layer so that we can make some adjustments. For example, her wedding dress lost a lot of detail, so maybe I can create a a layer that you know just targets that dress and try to bring as much detail as possible. The point is that you have endless possibilities with separating the foreground from the background because you can do pretty much anything see that or maybe if i want to create this effect where he's in color but the rest of the image is not we can do that so completely up to you how you handle that by the way if you were going to do something like this where he's in color and the rest of the image is not what you would have to do at this point is create a layer between um or as long as it is clipped it doesn't have to be between the adjustment layer but a layer that is clipped to him change the blending mode to color and we'll do what we did earlier remember select the color that's on his body like this and paint away that green because that green wouldn't be on him if this were really a realistic picture but anyway it doesn't matter the point is that you can make these adjustments by separating the foreground from the background and you can get some really really interesting results let's see we got a couple minutes why should i i don't have enough time to show you the other thing i was going to show you um but i can show you like maybe the coolest part from it let me see Yeah, I can show you the coolest part from it. Um, so we have um, this image here. And as you know, you can go into edit. I'm sorry, not edit. Is it under edit? Why am I blank in here? Sky replacement, because I'm on the wrong layer. Uh, so you select the layer, you can go into edit, sky replacement. And Photoshop will use AI to analyze the image and replace the sky. I'm sure that a lot of you probably already knew that. That's not something that is new. But what is new is, or not new, that I should say it's not new. This, this was available the day it came out. But what you may not know is that Photoshop can open up video files and we can do a sky replacement on the video file. So there's my video of London. I'm opening up the video and it's a short mp4 and as you can see there it is london the key is that the image needs to be shot on a tripod it can't move around photoshop doesn't have motion tracking like after effects but with a video file you can definitely do this you need to trick photoshop you need to um take your video group and convert it into a smart object then you can go into edit sky replacement otherwise it won't work and then Photoshop replaces the sky on that video. You can press OK to up output your result. And as you can see, we have replaced the sky 
on this video, but you need to make sure that your video layers are all long enough. There they are. And now when I hit play, you can see that we have in fact changed the sky on this video. Pretty cool, right? And how much time do I have? A minute. I can do this in a minute. I can now stop that, please. Thank you. Uh, I can now make sure that these are linked. Press Control J to transform. Control T, I mean Control J to duplicate. Control T to transform, and flip vertical, and then move this down like so. And I'll just delete the layer mask because we don't need it, or we do need it, but not in those areas. I'll create my own mask. And I'll just paint with white to reveal the sky on these areas. And since I have like 10 seconds, I'm just going to go super fast. But you guessed that these are the, the reflections and I can just bring down the opacity. But we have reflections now. Yay. So when I hit play, we have something that looks a little more realistic. OK, everybody, thank you so much for watching. It's been amazing being here with you this week. If you can catch, uh, you can catch me on my YouTube channel, the Photoshop training channel on YouTube, my new podcast, Today's Creator. Make sure you check it out. It's been amazing. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Anyway, everybody have a wonderful week, uh, weekend, and I will talk to you next time. Thank you so much. Bye.